will sing number 156, 156, first and fourth. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this Lord's Day and for the blessings that it affords us, for what it means to us as the day that we come together to commune together and to think about things spiritual, to observe the commands that you have left us for worship. We're grateful for the opportunity to do that. Grateful for these songs that have just been led, especially the thought of this last song that only in you, dear God, do blessings exist that are worth anything in this life. And we're thankful for the fact that you are willing to bestow those upon us so richly every day. Thankful for many of those blessings now, dear God, the blessings of being able to be part of this congregation, to be part of its work, to take part in the things that are happening here and we're so grateful for the good things that are taking place for the eldership that leads us here for the bible teachers and for everyone involved in moving the work forward we're especially grateful dear god for the growth that we have seen lately for those who have chosen to obey your gospel and put christ on in baptism and we pray dear god that we would continue to be encouragements to one another as we move forward together grow closer to you as we grow closer to one another, serving you together. We're mindful today, dear God, of those of our number who are experiencing the loss of loved ones and their families. We pray your blessings and comfort and our encouragement to them in the next and coming days. Thankful again, dear God, for the opportunity to assemble here for the songs that we will sing, for the message that we will hear, and for Brother Chad and his ability to deliver it. We're grateful for the opportunity to approach you in prayer, and we ask this prayer in the name of your dear Son and our Savior. Amen. Rise up, O men of God, have done with last of things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of kings. Rise up, O men of God, His kingdom
88. For our lesson, we'll sing number 526. If you'll stand, please. 526. We talked last Sunday night about epitaphs, and we looked at some, some Bible epitaphs that were written by God from the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and I want to, I had some more material to go with that, and so what I thought was kind of continue those thoughts this evening with a look at some other Bible epitaph, epitaphs, and then we will look uh, at a third part of this, which might be considered some epitaphs that you might see uh, in, in modern day times. Uh, you know, we mentioned last week, we all know it's appointed unto men once to die, Hebrews 9, 27, and after this, the judgment. Uh, that is the common fate of all of us. And, and really, we often say, unless we live until the Lord returns, and even if we live till the Lord returns, there's still going to have to be a separation between body and spirit, which is, in, in a, it would be a death in a sense, because death represents separation of body and spirit, because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. So even then, there would have to be a separation uh, to receive the resurrection body. We looked at several last week. We looked at uh, Abel. He, he's dead, yet still speaking. Uh, Enoch and Noah both had the epitaph, he walked with God. Uh, Abraham, father of nations and friend of God. We talked about Moses, whose epitaph was the man that God knew face to face. And then we talked about uh, Rahab, who was former harlot, forever ancestor of Jesus, the Christ, the Savior of the world. Let's look at a few other ones, and I, I want to go through this quickly, and then we'll look at the third part of this, which will be kind of noting some potential modern-day epitaphs, I guess we could say. But there's, there's David. Acts 13, 22 says, He was a man after God's own heart. That's probably one of the most famous epitaphs in all of Scripture. Almost everyone remembers David. He's the man after God's own heart. Now, was he perfect? No. Was he sinless? Absolutely not. He made some horrible mistakes in his life. But he had a heart that sought God. And that's how he's remembered. There's also King Jeroboam. 1 Kings 14, 16 and 1 Kings 15, 30 tell us that Jeroboam made Israel to sin. Now, we understand that he didn't make anybody do anything. But we also understand that leaders, well, they do just that. They lead. And where they lead, people tend to follow, especially if it's a national leader. 
Here's a man who was a national leader, and instead of leading the nation toward God, God gave him ten tribes when he rent the kingdom from uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, because of Solomon's idolatry, marrying those strange women that took away his heart from God. God said, I'm taking the kingdom away, giving ten of those tribes to Jeroboam, and he was going to bless Jeroboam, but here's a man who decided he's just going to do things his own way. Sets up a calf in Dan, a calf in Bethel. It's too far to go to Jerusalem, Israel. Just go worship the calf of your choice. Take, take your pick. Whichever one's closer, which one's more, whichever one's more convenient. He made priests of the common people. He changed the time of worship. And we've talked about all this. But the Bible records him and remembers him as the man who made Israel to sin. In fact, 13 times referring to 13 different kings, and I may be including him in that, it's either 12 or 13 other kings, this statement is made. He walked in the sins of Jeroboam, his father, who made Israel to sin. King Baasha, King Jehu, King Omri, Ahaziah, Jehoram, Jehu, Jehoahaz, Jehoash, Jeroboam II, Zechariah, Pekahiah, and Pekah. All those kings, it's mentioned, surrounding their biography, he followed in the footsteps of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Now, how would you like to be remembered as the man who made an entire country, who led an entire country into sin? That's how he's remembered forever in the pages of the Bible. Certainly, that's an example we don't want to follow. Barnabas. Here's another one that a lot of folks know from Acts 4.36. The son of encouragement. Son of consolation is the way the King James puts it, but it means son of encouragement. He was an encourager. In fact, in Acts 9, when Paul had just obeyed the gospel, Saul of Tarsus there that we often refer to as the Apostle Paul, he had just become a Christian. He's a persecutor turned Christian. But the disciples say, oh, you're a Christian? Yeah, right. Like we're going to fall for that so you can come in here and arrest us all and take us all and kill us for being Christians. Not going to happen, Paul. March right along, buddy. You're not coming into our assembly. Well, Paul's sitting there saying, no, really, I'm a Christian now. And, and these people, they don't want to accept him. A man named Barnabas comes along and encourages him. Barnabas takes John Mark later on when Paul doesn't want to take him because John, for whatever reason, we don't know exactly why, but at some point he departed from a mission trip. And Paul says, I'm not taking him with me on another trip. And, and, and certainly we understand where Paul's coming from there. He says, well, you know, he might leave again, and I need somebody who's going to be dependable. But Barnabas was willing to give him another chance. He says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place some confidence in this fellow. I'm going to encourage him. And because of that, at the end of Paul's life in 2 Timothy 4, Paul says, bring Mark when you come. He's writing there to Timothy. He says, bring Mark, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. He's remembered as a son of encouragement. Then there's Rehoboam, Solomon's son. 2 Chronicles 12, 14 tells us he did not prepare his heart to seek the law of the Lord. We, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us just an overabundance about King Rehoboam. We know he, he really foolishly listened to the young folks' advice over the older folks who gave a lot better, wiser advice. We know that about him, but we don't know a whole lot about him personally, but this tells us a lot. He didn't prepare his heart to seek God. Now, you contrast that with Ezra 7.10, where it says of Ezra, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek God the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Here's the polar opposite of Ezra in Rehoboam. I don't want to be remembered that way. I don't think you do either, but that's how he's remembered. Micaiah, 1 Kings 22, 1 to 14. Ahab and um, Jehoshaphat have made this alliance, and they're going to go to war, and they, Ahab has all his yes men coming out, and they're saying, go up and prosper. You're going to win the battle, and they know that's what Ahab wants to hear, so they're all telling him that. They don't have a prophecy from God. They're just telling him what he wants to hear. And he likes it that way. He's pretty well content with that. Well, let's go. You hear what they're saying. And Jehoshaphat had enough sense about him. He didn't have enough sense, really, because he, he was making an alliance with Ahab. But he did have enough sense at least to say, is there not a prophet of God around here? Is there not a true prophet of Jehovah that we can ask and, and get a real answer here? I mean, he knew those were just yes men. Ahab says, well, there's that one guy, but I hate him. He doesn't ever say anything good about me. I can't stand that guy. So they bring him, and when they go to get Micaiah, the, the men say to him, 
everybody's prophesying, telling him to go up and prosper. Don't rock the boat. Don't cause problems. Just go tell him to go up and prosper. Tell him what he wants to hear, Micaiah. Don't cause any, any trouble. And Micaiah says very succinctly and very boldly, whatsoever the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. He says, don't try to bully me. Don't try to bribe me. Don't try to tell me what I'm going to speak because whatever God tells me is what I will speak. And now his epitaph is forever remembered by Bible students as a man who spoke the word of Jehovah God Almighty. What a great epitaph to say, you know what, here's a man who spoke the word of the Lord. That's Micaiah. Then there's King Asa, 2 Chronicles 16. His epitaph is simply, he did foolishly. Here's a man who had won great battles by the grace of God and by the help of God. And then the king of Israel, Baasha, comes against him and starts building these fortifications and building up cities, and he's going to cause some problems for Asa. So what does Asa do? He turns to God again for help, right? Wrong. He turns to the king of Syria, and he sends money from some of the gold in God's temple, sends money and says, hey, look, man, you and I, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, a league between us. And you help me make sure we defeat Baasha, king of Israel, and I'll give you this money. And the prophet comes to him and says, was God not with you in those other battles? Didn't God take care of those other enemies for you because you trusted in the Lord? And now you're suddenly going to decide, I'm, I need to send money to pay off some heathen nation king to come and fight your battles for you. He says, you have done foolishly. And that's how he's remembered in Scripture. We could talk about Josiah, the great reformer. That's his memorial, 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. Here's a man in the midst of so many idolatrous, horrible kings of Israel. He comes along and he says, we're going to make some changes, Israel. We're going to seek the law of God. We're going to do what God would have us to do. We're not going to fool around with idols anymore. And he even goes into what was the old northern kingdom. And he eradicates idolatry there as well, as a man who was zealous for reforming the nation of Judah and, of course, of Israel as well. Uzziah, it wasn't probably a little over a year ago, I guess, that I preached a sermon looking at the life of Uzziah. In 2 Chronicles 26, the first 21 verses there, he, he was blessed by God and he had all these wonderful things going for him as a king. But it says, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. You want that in Southern English? I'll give it to you in Southern English. When he was strong, he got too big for his britches. That's, that's it, Southern English for, for what happened to Uzziah. He just got too big for his britches. He decided, you know what, I'm, I'm a big shot. And so he's going to go into the temple and he's going to offer a sacrifice. And the priests withstood him and they said, It appertaineth not unto thee, O king. And he became so angry and was going to have them arrested, but then the leprosy began to rise and he was a leper till the day of his death. His heart was lifted up to his destruction. You know, if God revealed from heaven, can you imagine how different graveyards would be if God inscribed an epitaph on every grave marker? But how awful would it be to have to be remembered by the Lord and, and fellow man as someone who you serve, the God, you serve God faithfully for so many years, but when you were blessed sort of at the zenith of your blessings, we might say, you suddenly decided, you know what? I am pretty good, ain't I? I'm doing pretty well. Like Nebuchadnezzar said one day as he's walking through the palace, he said, boy, look at this. Look at this wonderful palace that I have built. Look at this wonderful nation that I have built. You know, you could just hear him saying, boy, ain't I so great? And, of course, God humbled Nebuchadnezzar as well. Uzziah, was, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Paul, we could talk about Paul, changed by the gospel. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy 1. I know we've we paraphrased most of these, but this is one that I think is worth going and reading together. I love this passage. When you think about Paul and, and his epitaph, someone who was changed by the gospel, former persecutor, but he became, he went from the persecutor to the preacher. He went from the persecutor to the persecuted. He was persecuted many times for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
But in 1 Timothy 1, beginning at verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul says, I was changed by the gospel. I've told you all before about my friend Billy in South Alabama, big old burly man. He could have he could have just whoop somebody like me and just be a light snack, you know. <laughs> but uh, this fellow was being a, a real rude person one day when we were somewhere. We were out, may, may have been when we stopped for lunch or something, but um, this fellow was really being kind of a jerk. And Billy was sitting there talking to me, and I, I was, he was the heating and air guy that I worked with for just a little while when I was down there in South Alabama. And he says, he says, Boy, I'd really like to get after that guy. And I'm thinking, boy, you could. I mean, he, he'd be, uh, he'd better pack a lunch if he's going to mess with Billy, that, that little fella. But, uh, but he says, but I'm a Christian now, so I don't do that anymore. You know, that's the idea. That's the idea with Paul. Maybe there were times when Paul says, you know, can you imagine Paul, especially some of his dealings with the Corinthian brethren? Some of those brethren that attacked his authority as an apostle and questioned him whether, whether they ought to even be listening to him. How tempting it would be for Paul to say, you know what? I, I want to go back to my Jewish roots and let's start with the 40 stripes save one. Let's, go, let's get after those fellas. But, you know, he says, I'm changed by the gospel. I'm not like that anymore. I'm a different person. And this is the epitaph that there are some folks that no doubt if God wrote their epitaph, it would say he did foolishly. If God wrote their epitaph, it might say his heart was lifted up to his destruction he sought not the Lord with his heart. But there are a lot of folks that this right here is their epitaph. If God were to write it, he might write on there, here's a, here's a man that he, he had all kind of problems. He hurt a lot of people in his earlier days, but changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is to be able to say, you know what? I'm changed by the gospel. Well, that's Paul. Well, let's go on into uh, part three here, and let's look at some potential modern-day epitaphs. Now, many of these are not, not original with me, so I don't want to take credit where it's not due. Some of these are sort of humorous, but they also get us to thinking, what might my epitaph be when I leave this earth? And, of course, our future, as we said last week, in the by and by depends on how we live in the here and now. Here's one epitaph that might be on somebody's grave. Red E. Helper. A ready helper. He always served the Lord. Romans 16 verse 3 talks about Priscilla and Aquila. And Paul calls them my helpers in Christ Jesus. He said these are my helpers. Well are we ready helpers for the Lord? Or are we nowhere to be found when there's something that needs to be done? Somebody was telling me. Uh, we were talking about this at one point. might have been Brother Jim. was telling me that he, he knew a fellow many years ago that would make the statement even as something as simple as a piece of paper on the floor. And he said he would ask himself the question and encourage every member. Was this you, Brother Jim? And he would say, if not me, who? If not now, when? You think about that. If I practice that with things that need done in the Lord's church, even to the point of just a piece of paper on the floor, and you know, yeah, well, if I don't pick that up, who will? And if I don't pick it up now, then when? What, in other words, what am I waiting for? And what, what, may, what would make me think that I'm beyond that? Barring some kind of physical ailment or something? Ready helper. 1 Corinthians 16, 15 talks about the household of Stephanus. It says they were addicted to the ministry of the saints. We need that kind of an addict in the Lord's church. Those who are addicted to helping others, to serving others. So ready helper might go on somebody's tombstone. That certainly would be a good epitaph to have. We might have somebody that has on their tombstone the epitaph, will and teacher, a willing teacher. He taught the word, might be the, the byline there. 
2 Timothy 2, verse 2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You see, that's God's pattern for propagating the Lord's church. You go and you teach. Jesus told the apostles, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And he's going to bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. But he tells them, he says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So we got to teach. And then when we teach others, they are to go on then and teach others. So we need willing teachers in the Lord's church. Without them, how is Christianity going to be propagated? We need those willing teachers. Another tombstone might be for Brother I'm a Worker. The tombstone might say, Always Abounding, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, overflowing in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know Jesus said in John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. You see, somebody like I'm a worker knows that there's a limited opportunity to serve. Can you think of the number of people there we can't begin to think of the number of people who are lost right now in the Hadean realm who are thinking, I would give anything to go back and to serve and to work in the church, to work for the Lord, not trying to earn something. They know better than that, but working because we've been so blessed by the Lord and because understanding that we are God's hands on earth. We are God's feet on earth to take the gospel to the world. There are so many people lost who have passed into eternity that would give anything to come and have the opportunity to work, the opportunity that you and I have right now tonight. Are we workers in the kingdom of the Lord? There's also noble searcher. His, his tombstone might say, here lies a Bible student. The Bereans, remember, more noble than those in the Thessalonica because they searched, they, they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They were noble searchers, noble Bereans, we sometimes call them. Jesus said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? They shall be filled. If you have a hunger and thirst for the word of God and for righteousness, God will see to it that you are filled. Another tombstone might say, Mr. B.Z. Body, busy body. His business was everyone's business. Boy, isn't that the way it is with some folks? We certainly don't want to have that as our memorial. Think about 2 Thessalonians 3, 11 and 12. In fact, if you're still there in uh, 1 Timothy, you can go back just a little bit. 2 Thessalonians 3, 11 and 12, where he says, We hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that, they with, qui that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But, you know, there are folks that their business is everybody's business. Well, that certainly is not the way we ought to be. We, we're to tend to our own business. 1 Peter 4, 15 and 16, Peter says, Let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. But if any man suffer as a Christian, he says, Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. But sometimes there are folks that that's sort of the memorial that if we were truthful, they would have to have. Then there are some folks who would fall in this category of Mr. I don't know. I don't know. You know, the byline there says, the, the epitaph says he claimed to be a Christian. This is what we've been doing on Sunday morning, spending a lot of time with evidences and studying how did we get the Bible? How do we know that, uh, that we can even trust the Bible? You know, I was talking to uh, Jason Gray over at West Georgia today after the 2 o'clock service, and he was telling about somebody that he went to school with and what this fellow was saying, and a lot of this comes back exactly what we've been talking about, Brother Bob, and you know, this, this idea that you can't really trust the Bible, and so there's no authority there if you can't trust it, and so anything goes, basically. But Peter says, be ready. Be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Don't be like Mr. I don't know. Who just says, well, yeah, I, I don't know. I've I just always been raised in the church, so... You know, I mean, that's, that's the way it's always been for me, and that's the way it's going to be. Well, that's a person that just claims to be a Christian. Peter says, you be ready to answer 
Because by answering, by so answering, you might help somebody to go from the realm of darkness into the kingdom of light. Then, of course, you got people like what Paul described in 2 Timothy 3, 7. They're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Brother Cates, uh, one of my instructors there at Memphis and passed away recently, but Brother Cates used to talk about folks, and, and he, was, he was very educated. He held a doctorate in education and several other degrees as well. But uh, th this was a man that was highly educated, but he also saw a lot of folks where education ruined them. And he would talk about that, and he would say, you know, it's, it's good to study and to learn, but there are folks that are absolutely like what Paul's describing in 2 Timothy 3, 7. They're ever learning. They're never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Jerry Clower used to put it this way. He'd say they're educated beyond their intelligence. <laughs> That's a humorous statement, but I think sometimes there's some truth to that. We need to make sure that when we study, we study properly and obtain the knowledge why do I believe what I believe? I can't emphasize this enough for our young folks, especially our teenagers, because so often what happens is the teenagers, they don't answer that question. They're Mr. I don't know. And they claim to be Christians, but then they go to college and they start hearing this stuff from these professors that spout these same old, tired, worn-out arguments. And, and, and that's one of the things that frustrates me most because they are these are arguments many times that have been refuted time and time again. But they... They just start throwing them out there, and these young folks hear that, and they, they haven't established in their own minds, why do I believe what I believe, and they begin to fall away. We certainly don't want that to happen. So don't be Mr. or Miss, I don't know. Don't be like his cousin either, I don't care. You know, that's, that's a problem sometimes. Well, here's a fellow that was warned. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. It's like God says, folks, you were warned. Remember the billboards they used to put up and they'd have these uh, statements and then it'd be like it was a statement from God. One of them says something like, have you read my bestseller? Uh, there will be a test, something, like, something to that effect. God tells us, he's, there's a, it's, he's, you're warned. Fair warning. There's going to be a test. Be ready. But some folks have the attitude, I, I don't know and I don't care. I heard a fellow one time and he was walking out of the church building and the preacher asked him, says, do you know what the biggest problem in the Lord's church is today? He said, I don't know and I don't care. He said, brother, you nailed it. That's a big problem in the church. A lack of knowledge and a lack of care. Some, you know, it's one thing to be ignorant. I can go if I'm ignorant and find the information, but if I don't care, then I'm not going to go and find the information. Jesus says, John 5, 28 and 29, the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And they're going to come forward, those that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. We've been warned. So God forbid we fall into the category of Mr. or Miss, I don't care. Then there's lukewarm. You know about lukewarm. Revelation 3, 15 and 16, talking to the church there at Laodicea. You're not, warm, you're not hot or cold, you're, you're lukewarm. And he says, so then because you're neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. His epitaph would be, literally, he made God sick, or she made God sick. God says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Goes on in verse 17, he says, you know, you think you've, you, you say you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You know, it's kind of like saying to somebody who's terribly, terribly ill and, and, and very, very noticeably physically ill. You say, man, I, you know, I, I think you're, uh, you, can you just picture somebody convulsing on the ground? And you say, I, I, think, I think we need to call a doctor. And he's sitting there as he shakes, saying, no, no, I'm good. Don't, don't worry about it. I'm okay. You know, that's the way the church at Laodicea was. They're sitting there saying, everything's fine. We don't have need of anything. And Jesus says, you don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He said, you're in bad shape, and you don't know. It's like old Samson. Delilah cut off his hair, and here come the Philistines, and he gets up, and he's going to take care of business, right? <laughs> nope, because the hair was gone, and the strength was gone, and he was captured. The problem is, we have the means to know it, but do we care? Are we taking time to obtain that knowledge? Don't be like 
Mr. Luke Warm. There's also Jess T. Busy, just too busy. Epitaph might say now he has plenty of time. Luke 10, 38 to 42, Mary and Martha. It's a familiar account, and, and I don't want to get the wrong idea because the, the nudge that Jesus gives to Martha is not to a lady who's so busy that she's neglecting spiritual things. This is a lady who's tending to worthwhile matters. I mean, she's got the Lord in her home. She wants everything to be just right, like I suspect many of you would want if the Lord came to your house. I would try to tidy up and make it presentable. <laughs> but, you know, most of us guys would. But the ladies might say, well, you know, I want everything to be just right. And she's trying to clean up and take care of those things. Are those things wrong? No. Are they bad? No. Are they good? Yes. But what Jesus' point is, you have the Lord in your home. He's not going to be here long. Take advantage of that. Choose the better part. What about sports? whether you're watching sports or playing sports. What about traveling for a vacation? Those are all wonderful things. We need vacations from time to time. We need recreational activity. But if we do it at the expense of spiritual activities, it becomes the same category of Mr. Busy here. Just too busy. But there's going to come a time when, again, we'll wish we had another opportunity to go take advantage of that. Then there's absentee. Epitaph would just say they're never there. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, so much the more, uh, exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Don't be like Mr. Absentee. Then there's carry a grudge. Carry a grudge. He refused to forgive, or she refused to forgive. Matthew 18, 15 to 17 gives the clear teaching of the Lord. You, if a brother does you wrong, then you go to him. You don't, you know, we, we sometimes do that the exact opposite, don't we? Somebody offends me, and I go to you, 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 and you. I go to everybody but that brother sometimes. But Jesus says if your brother offends you, or, and of course, by extension, if it's a sister, you go to him, and you say, you know what? I, you, you did me wrong. And then if they hear you, then guess what? You have gained your brother, and you've also avoided a big blow-up, by the way. But he says if he doesn't, then you take two. Two or three, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything may be established. And if you won't listen to them, then you tell it to the church. And if you won't listen to the church, then, he's, then that's what we would call withdrawal of fellowship, to be like a heathen and a publican to you. Luke 17, 3 and 4, Jesus is very clear. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he turns to you seven times in a day saying, I, I, I repent, then forgive him seven times. But boy, carry a grudge, going to hold on to that. The heaviest burden in the world you'll ever pick up and carry around is a grudge. Let it go. Learn to forgive when people want to make things right. Then there's Mr. Ben putting off. Epitaph would simply just say, never got around to it. Just never got around to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 Paul is writing here, and I, and I know this. Some people say this is not the exact context, but I, I, think, I think there's an application here. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation, he says. In other words, do it now. Don't put it off. Too often we put things off. Turn, I'm, I'm still in 2 Thessalonians, but you can turn back just a few pages to Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5, he deals with this in verses 14 to 16 where he says, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. This, and of course, next verse, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time, making the most of the time, in the sense of don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. Well, that saying's not original with me, of course, but that certainly is a biblical thought. Don't put off till tomorrow what you can take care of today. Whether that's obeying the gospel to become a child of God. Maybe you say, you know what, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. I, I believe he's God's son. I'm willing to confess his name is Lord. And I, I, I want to give my life to him. And I'm going to be baptized someday. I'm going to do it one day. Well, I read something. Uh, it was just the other day that talked about a fellow 
He was a preacher. He had encouraged his dad for years and years and years. And you know, his dad, he, li- he was a preacher, so he lived a long way away from his dad. And he called his dad one day, or his dad called him, and he said, son, um, he, the boy was going to preach a meeting somewhere within just a few hours' drive. And he said, son, we're going to come here, you preach, and I want you to know I'm ready. I think I'm going to obey the gospel. The son was so tickled, he said, Dad, why don't you know, do it now? Call the preacher. No, no, I think I'm going to come, come hear you. And you know that man never made it to that meeting. He died before he ever got to the son's meeting that was coming up. What a sad thought to think you put something off that you could do today until tomorrow and then have tomorrow never come. Maybe it's a, a grudge that you need to put down. Maybe it's somebody that you need to forgive. Maybe it's coming back to the Lord. You've been astray. Don't put it off. Don't have as your epitaph never got around to it. Thinking about this as we close out, what might go on your tombstone? How will God remember you? You know, you think about this. We talk in our families, and I'm not trying to be depressing or morbid or whatever, but we talk in our families, and we may say, you know, granddad, and I, we all remember Granddad. I mean, we know Granddad, right? You know, if you, if you want candy or you want a treat or something, you can go see Granddad, Grandma. But then, you know, you talk about Great Granddad, Great Grandma. And sometimes we have some very fond memories of Great Granddad, Great Grandma. But then go to Great Great Grandmother. By then, little Johnny, little Sally, whoever it is, they say, Who's Great Great Grandma? Who's Great Great Grandpa? And you may even go to great, great, great grandma and grandpa. By this time, they're saying, I don't even recognize these these last names. Sometimes the last names have changed by then. And you start, you get the idea. Within a generation or two, I'm going to be forgotten. So are you. Maybe three or four generations. But we're going to be forgotten. When the time comes that people forget us, will God remember us? You see, I determine that by my life here. If 500 years, if 1,000 years pass after I leave this old earth, I mean, I may not even be remembered. They probably can't even find the place where I'm buried. But God will remember me if I'm his faithful child. I love Revelation 14, 13. Heard a voice saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yea, he said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. You see, there's coming a time on this earth when you and I, every single one of us, we're going to be forgotten. Not intentionally. That's just the natural course of things. But if this earth tarries for thousands, tens of thousands of years, God will never forget his faithful children. That's why... Whatever you've been putting off, get around to it tonight. Get around to it right now. Make sure your life is right with the Lord. Do it while we stand and sing to encourage you.
We're thankful for each of you who had a public part in our worship today, for all those who prepared lessons and taught, for Brother Johnny leading our singing this morning, for Brother Robert this evening, and Chad in his fine lessons. For all those that are visiting, you're honored guests, and we hope that you'll be back and be with us at your next appointed opportunity. Our next meeting here will be Wednesday at 7, and we hope you're making plans to be back with us at that time. Remind you of those that we mentioned this morning on our prayer list. We're glad to see Brother Hubert King able to be back with us. Brother Ken Glover as well was here this morning. You're asked to continue to remember Brother Glover who has some danger of some recurring difficulty, so certainly we should remember him and Phyllis. Alan Lloyd's aunt, Miss Mary Barr, who's a member of the church in uh, Mississippi, is to have surgery this week, correct? This week, November the 7th. Joan Thurman asked us to remember her friend, Miss Joyce Crawford, who had some death in the family, and she's struggling. She asked for our prayer on her behalf. As we uh, announced this morning, we have a uh, new brother and sister in Christ, Philip and Amanda Spake were baptized into Christ yesterday, and they have two sons, Preston and Ryan, and we again welcome them to the family here at Bremen. We extend our sympathy to the family of Barbara Cron in the passing of her son, Derek, yesterday. There are no arrangements at this time, but as far as um, any food, again, that would be the responsibility immediately of the uh, Brothers Keepers group, which is group four. Group four, she's in group four, so that's, uh, who's over group four? Chad and Reagan and, and uh, Robert and Cheryl are involved in that group. But again, we extend our sympathy to Sister Barbara. Uh, we went down and visited with her this uh, afternoon so that we could tell her in person or the family could tell her in person. And as you can imagine, she's rather distraught, but this was the oldest son, is that correct? Derek, who was 52 years of age. He was found in his home and died in his sleep last night. We also extend our sympathy to uh, the Wilson family in the passing of Stephen Wilson. This was Robert Orr Wilson's son. It's also the nephew of Rebecca Wheeler, Ronald, and David Wilson. We understand the funeral was today. The funeral was today. Are there others that we should mention? Yes. Okay, Brothers Keepers events. Group three, Brian and Rachel's group meets tonight, immediately after the evening service in the fellowship hall. Group one, Jimmy and Jan's group will meet tonight also at the home of Eric and Mary Blank. Group four, Chad and Reagan's group will meet at the home of Steve and Sabrina Williams Saturday this coming November 9. There's a sign up list in the foyer. Also, if you came in the building from the front door, you also noticed a table set up out there with cards. We're asking everyone to sign those cards, and those cards will be sent along with the care package that uh, Brother Robert is overseeing, Chad and Robert, for group four, for those that are um, participating in that event, get your money to Chad or Robert as soon as possible. These care packages are being assembled for Veterans Day, which is later this month, and they will be out there. Those cards will be out there through next Sunday, correct? through next Sunday. So you're encouraged to sign those cards and those will be sent to family members of this congregation and friends of this congregation who have active uh, military servants. Group two, Johnny Melanie's group will meet uh, next Sunday after the evening service at the home of Martin and Connie Higley. Sign up list in the foyer. Ladies Devo and lunch is this coming Thursday, November the 7th, 11 a.m. Lasagna, salad and desserts are the meal. Please let Joyce know what you can bring. The ladies, Thanksgiving, luncheon, all the tables have been spoken for, so we got that taken care of. There's a meeting at West Georgia that continues uh, through Wednesday. Brother Frank Chesser is conducting that meeting. There is no evening meeting tonight, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week, 7 p.m. each evening. There's also a gospel meeting that began today at the Jacksonville, Alabama congregation. Brother Wayne Jones, the speaker, singing at 645, worship at 7, Monday through Thursday, Central Time. Piedmont Road has a marriage workshop November 8th and 9th, which will be later on this week. And there's a youth retreat in Childersburg, Alabama, upcoming later this month. More details to follow. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the left, and there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Again, our next service, Wednesday at 7. 
Should we mention anything else? Final song, brother. 48. 48 will be our final song. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. Dear Father, we are so thankful that we were able to come here today and open your Bible and study and learn. Dear Father, we are so thankful for Chad and his labor of love for the truth. Dear Father, help us to go out this week and be a shining light for you and guide, guard, and direct us in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.